morning, everyone. Welcome to Three Crosses Church. It's so good to have you in worship this morning. Uh, my name is Rick Rodriguez, and uh, as many of you may know, many of you probably don't know, I am uh, a Sunday school leader, uh, one of our Sunday school uh, classes here at the church. And I encourage you, if you have not, uh, do not have a Sunday school home, uh, see me or somebody after church, me after church, if you'd like to uh, be in a Sunday school class, I highly encourage that you uh, join one if you can. One thing about being a Sunday school leader is <clears throat> I have to do a lot of preparation, which gets me into the Word a lot, and uh, our Sunday school class is currently uh, covering the book of Colossians. And uh, Friday, I was reading, uh, getting prepared for this class, and I came across this scripture, which really spoke a lot to me. One thing about the, about the scriptures, as you know, is, is they're living words, and every time I read Scripture, it may, no matter if it's the same one I've read maybe a couple weeks ago or a month ago, it speaks to me differently, and this one did. This is out of Colossians chapter 2, verses 9-10. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to, fo- to fullness. He is head over every power and authority. So I think about that, and it's amazing to think that the fullness of Christ is already in us. If you think about it, he says it's already been brought to us. It's not, it's in process. The fullness of Christ is already in us. And so I question myself, how am I living in that reality? Am I living in the reality that Christ's fullness is already in me? Or, I'm, or am I waiting for Christ to do something else? Or is there something else I need to do to have the fullness of Christ in me? But what Paul is saying, it's already in us. It's done. And I think I need to start living my life in the reality that the fullness of Christ already dwells in me. And that means having faith in what I do and knowing that Jesus is the master of my life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning and this day and that we can celebrate our nation's independence this weekend, Lord. We are so blessed to live in a country that is free. And Father God, help us have the reality and know the reality that you already live fully, fully in us, that it's already done, Lord, and that is good, good news. So Father God, help us live that out in our worship and our relationships with others, whether it be a small group of Sunday school or with our, our spouses or our family. Help us, Lord, to always keep you first and always know that you are the master of our lives. So Father God, as we worship today, I want to Lay, your hand, lay our hands upon the worship leaders, our music leaders, those who will be uh, giving the Sunday school lesson to the children, reading our, our gospel lesson, and for Pastor Leah's message today, Lord. May the words that we hear be impressed upon our hearts and give us uh, strength, Lord, to do your will in all that we do. It is your most precious high name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and join us now as we sing. I saw the light. I wondered so aimless a life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger.
Galatians chapter 5, 13 and 14, and 6, 1 through 10. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses. 
but serve each other through love. All the laws has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Brothers and sisters, if a person is caught doing something wrong, you are spiritual you who are spiritual should restore someone like this with a spirit of gentleness. Watch out for yourselves so you won't be tempted to. Carry each other's burdens and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are important when they aren't, they're fooling themselves. Each person should test their own work and be happy with doing a good job and not compare themselves to others. Each person will have to carry their own load. Those who are taught the word should share all good things with their teacher. Make no mistakes, God is not mocked. A person will harvest what they plant. Those who plant only for their own benefit will harvest devastation from their selfishness. But those who plant for the benefit of the Spirit will harvest eternal life from the Spirit. Let's not get tired of doing good, because in time we'll have a harvest if we don't give up. So then... Let's work for the good of all whenever we have an opportunity, and especially for those in the household of faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. When all the children please come forward for the... Good morning. Good morning. Okay, this side is awake. Are y'all awake over here? No. <laughs> Let's try one more time. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. You guys having a good summer? Anybody been swimming? Yeah. Anybody been on the lake? Yeah. I think I saw. Yeah. A canoe. Awesome. Yeah? I think I opened a can of worms. <laughs> Sounds like, are you guys having a good summer? Yeah? You went on the boat too? Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. I love it. All right, so this morning, I have two things folded here. What do you guys think this might be if I unfolded it? What do you think? A heart. A heart. Hmm. Wonder what is on my heart. Hmm. Who would like to read what's on my heart? Ooh, look at all those hands go up. All right. You ready? I'm going to let you sit in the mic. Love God. All right. It says love God. All right. So tell me, how can we love God? Who knows how we can love God? He, uh... Protects us at night, and um, he protects me and my brother, and he um, he lets us um, get uh, some weather and kindness. That's awesome. That's definitely the way that God loves us, right? What's a way that you guys could love God? What do you want to share? We can, we can treat people nicely with love. Oh, I like that. I like that. What's another way that God loves us? How does God love us? Does God love us? Okay, just checking. God loves us the most. He does love us very much, doesn't he? That he sent Jesus for us, right? So it's really important that we love God, right? Do you love him a whole lot? Yeah, we love him a whole lot. Does he love us a whole lot? Yes, he loves us a whole, whole lot, right? Okay, so remember this heart. What does this one say? Love God. love God, and it's big, right? He loves us big, and we love him big, right? All right, I'm going over here to Mr. Powell because he's being all quiet this morning. All right, sir, you're going to read. I have a second heart. Would you read what's on that heart? Love your neighbors. Ooh, Love your neighbor. Why would that be on my heart? What's a neighbor? Oh, hang on. Next door. Okay, you said one more time. Somebody that's next door. Okay, somebody that lives next door to your house. What else is a neighbor? Um, um, I, my um, I my neighbor is named Ma, and 
She lives next door. Is she a nice neighbor? She is right close to me across the street. Yeah, Neighbors can be pretty awesome. We have a pretty nice neighbor, too, who likes to give my dog treats. And he only wants to go outside to get a treat from the neighbor instead of going to the bathroom. But did you know that all these people out here are also your neighbors? Yeah. They don't live next door to you, right? Do they live next door to you? Do these people all live next door to you? No. Well, yes, yeah, some of them might. But these people don't all live next door to you, right? So guess what? When it said in the Bible to love your neighbor, that didn't just mean the people that live next door to you. That means anybody. That means anybody. Well, that would be pretty cool if God lived next to us, wouldn't it? It'd be easy to just go over and talk to him about things, right? And then you could get a clear answer. Yeah, and God, is in heaven. God is in heaven. You're right. Okay, so how big did we love God? Show me. How big did we love God? A, a lot, right? How much does God love us? This much. Okay. So if your neighbor, is everybody in here, if your neighbor is also your brother or your sister, do you also, do you love your brothers and sisters always? Yes. No, look, he's honest. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on, hang on, hang on. No, not all the time. Not all the time? What would you say? I you forgot. Love your brother? Like, a girl kid is this. Do you love your brother? You love your brother? Uh, a whole lot this much. Oh, that's precious. Okay, you love your, look, even hugging each other. I didn't plant them, I promise. All right, so, let me, this is what I always say. I might not always like the way you're behaving, but I will always, what? Love you. My girls, that's what I tell them sometimes. You know, you may not like your sister right now, but you always love her. But sometimes is it hard to love your brother if they're picking on you or your sister? Yeah. Do you sometimes get mad at your mom or dad when they say no when you really want to go swimming or you want to go to the lake? Yeah? yeah. Makes you kind of mad, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. But guess what? Even when we're mad or aggravated or upset, guess what God wants us to do? How much do you think he wants us to love our neighbor? Show me. How big do you think he wants us to love our neighbor? <gasps> Wait. You said we were supposed to love God that big. Supposed to love God and our neighbors the same? Supposed to love ever. Is that always easy? No. It's not always easy. But how could we love our neighbors? How could we show our neighbors love? How could you guys show these folks out here your, that you love them? Um, I love them a whole lot. You love them a whole lot. How else could you show them you love them? Not just by telling them. What else could you do? Um, you were just on fire. I could, um, I could help them or help them trim their uh, trees. Oh, did y'all hear that? You got a tree trimmer up here. <laughs> if you need some tree trimming. Anybody else? How else could you show them you love them? How else could you show them? You could help them mow the lawn. Oh, y'all, are y'all writing their names down? <laughs> All right, Mr. Powell, you're over here hiding. How are you going to show love to your neighbor? How are you going to do it? Come on. I, got, I, got, I can't wait. Loving them, them. How are you going to love them? Loving them. What are you doing right now to me? <laughs> are you smiling? Are you smiling? Smiling? Yeah, smiling at them, hugging them, right? Because we want them to know that we love them how much? How much? A whole lot. Just as much as God loves us, right? We want to love others. All right. So we're going to say a prayer. And then I have a little special 4th of July treat for you to take back to your seat. Do not get in trouble with it during church. Okay? Listen to your parents. All right. So we're going to pray. I'm going to say a little part, and y'all are going to echo after me. Okay? Congregation, y'all are welcome to join if you'd like. 
You got it. Echo. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you for loving us. Help us to love our neighbor just as much as you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. And what do you guys say? Also with you. Okay, we're going to have to all do this or y'all can make me look like a goober. Either way, it's okay because Jesus loves us. Dum, 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 dum. Y'all can do this. You know this song. Okay, we're going to try that again. Dum, 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 There you go. Okay, we will get there. And then what is it? It's pressure. Pressing down on me, pressing down on you, no man asks for. Under pressure, burns a building down, splits a family in two, puts people on the streets by that death. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> and you know, for, for our younger ones, it, uh, the audience, and maybe even your Disney lovers, maybe when you see the word pressure, you think pressure that just drip, 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 drips and just won't stop, right? Pressure that makes you tip, tip, tip till you just go pop from Encanto. Yeah, absolutely. Pressure. Anybody ever felt pressure? Amen. You know, pressure is something that we live with sometimes daily sometimes pressure isn't a bad thing you know it takes a little bit of stress to motivate us to do work but too much it does feel like it can burn the building down too much and it does split families in two you know the biblical word for pressure i've decided Biblical doesn't say pressure, but it says burdens. <coughs> burdens is the biblical word for pressure. So I guess you could change the song. I guess Jesus would say, burdens bearing down on you. Burdens. And this is why I write sermons and not songs. <laughs> but seriously, burdens. Anybody carrying any burdens this morning? That's okay. I don't like to admit my burdens either. We're going to talk about that. But you know the good news is in Scripture, every time it says burdens in Scripture, where it talks about us carrying burdens or God carrying our burdens, every time in Scripture that it mentions burdens, it comes with a promise of freedom. You know, it's scripture today paul says christ in christ we have freedom and part of that freedom is from burdens so the good news is today whatever burdens you brought with you the good news is you came here and you're meeting christ who says i've got freedom for those burdens 
Amen? Amen. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, he goes, you've been given freedom. Guess what? You are free. Yes, we're celebrating July the 4th, the freedom of our nation. But you and I, as disciples of Jesus, we're free through him as well. And Paul tells the Galatians, let me tell you, you have this freedom. And also with that freedom comes the freedom of choice. Let me tell you how I hope you use your freedom in Christ. Your freedom in Christ, don't use it for selfish gain. I would even add, don't let your freedom in Christ go cold and moldy. A.K.A. don't do anything with it, let it just set. Don't use it for selfish gain. Don't grow mold. Instead, use it for good. Use it, he says, to love your neighbor. Use it to love your neighbor as you love yourself and you fulfill, it says, all the law. Guess what? To love your neighbor as yourself, guess who you have to love first? God. Yes. Whoever answered me, you're absolutely right. Awesome, Beckett. (laughs) To love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that if you don't love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. But it's interesting as you go into Galatians 2, Galatians 6, 2, excuse me, 6, 2, it says, carry each other's burdens. I'm going to read that again because it's really important. Carry each other's burdens and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. So as Paul is saying, if you want to fulfill the law of Christ... We're going to carry each other's burdens. You might think, well, what is the law of Christ? Some would say that it's love God and love people. Love God and love your neighbor. But I'm going to challenge us this morning that the law of Christ goes beyond just loving God and loving your neighbor. You may say, Pastor Leah, that's what I've been told all my life. What's beyond loving God? And loving your neighbor. John 13. John 13. Jesus is getting ready to give himself up for us. John 13. Jesus has his disciples around him. And he decides to wash their feet. He takes a basin and towel, wraps it around them, and washes their nasty, dirty feet. If you're wearing sandals, you're in sand. You probably, if you've been to the beach, you know how nasty sand and feet can get. Or dirt and feet. So Jesus washes their feet. He does the job of a slave. Which if somebody's coming to visit you, you want to offer hospitality, you want to remove their burdens. One way, you're simply removing the bur- burden of dirty feet. But after he does that, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. Did you hear that? Jesus says, I have a new commandment for you. He said, I want you to love each other, love one another. Well, Jesus, there's not nothing new about that. Imagine Jesus says, wait, stay with me. He says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Not not as yourself. I want you to love each other as I have loved you. As Jesus has loved you and I, we are supposed to love one another. So, this week I thought, all right, So how has Jesus loved me? If I'm supposed to love you all like Jesus loved me, then first of all, don't you think I need to figure out how Jesus has loved me? So I started thinking about it. And of course, the first thought that comes to my mind is, 
well, Jesus died for me. And I thought, God, I'm not sure I'm ready to die for any of these people. I thought, then I thought, God, that seems just like a churchy answer. You ever give the churchy answer? What happens when you give the churchy answer to the unchurched? They just, they quit listening. Y'all are talkative today. Maybe we need a karaoke moment at every sermon. (laughs) They quit listening or they just brush you off. Say, yeah, yeah, sure, I know. So I didn't want to go there. Even though that's absolutely true, Jesus did die for me. He died for you. He died for our sins. I thought, God, but if I say that to even somebody who's been hurt by the church, I've lost them. So, Jesus, how did you love me? How do you love me? How have you loved the whole world? So I went back to the gospel with this question. All four of them went back to, and said, Jesus, show me how you've loved us, how you loved me. And this is what I think Jesus showed me. I'm going to share with you. This is how Jesus has not only loved Leah, but he's loved you. And that neighbor that you were secretly complaining about in your mind when Brittany was up here talking about loving her neighbors, this is how Jesus loved that person too. First thing, how did Jesus love us? The first thing he did in loving us is he emptied himself for us. Jesus loved us by emptying himself for us. Philippians 2. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God, something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus loves us by emptying himself for us. So if you and I are going to love like Jesus has loved us, if we're going to love each other like Jesus has loved us, that means we're going to empty ourselves. We're going to pour ourselves out of ourselves. For one another. Well, Jesus left a throne in heaven. I, I'm not sure we shouldn't ask ourselves what thrones we should shouldn't we need to kick ourselves off of. The throne of it's my time, and I'm gonna spend it the way I want, the way I see fit. Maybe we need to empty ourselves of a few of our priorities that we can let go of. Maybe we need to empty ourselves of our blinders that we wear. Maybe we need to empty ourselves of our judgments that we carry. See, if we're going to love like Jesus loves, we're going to empty ourselves. We're not going to hold thrones. We're going to empty ourselves and we're going to meet people where they're at. Because that's way number two Jesus loved us. Going to the Gospel of John. John, number two, the way Jesus has loved us. He came, the light, hold on. He came and dwelt among us. The way the message put put it is Jesus moved into the neighborhood. I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it. So number two is dwelling with people. We're going to love the way Jesus loved us. Then we're going to dwell with people. Guess what? Life is messy. I, I know I didn't tell you anything 
that you didn't already know. Life is messy. People make bad decisions. People make the best decision that they can make at the moment, and it still is messy. But Jesus came and dwelled with us in our darkness. You know, if we really we want to take another song, think about the Christmas song, Long Way the World and Sin and Air of Pining. It talks about the darkness. But if we love like Jesus, we come and we don't just visit. We don't just visit somebody's darkness. We don't just visit somebody who's having a tough time and say, Oh, gee, I'll pray for you. Yes, pray for them. If you're going to say that, do it. You don't, or say, Oh, I'm so sorry, and then leave. That means we pitch a tent and we walk with somebody through that darkness. We walk side by side with them. And we shine the light of Christ. Jo the Gospel of John also says that the light came to the world, but human beings love darkness because their deeds were evil, hurtful, shameful. And they knew if they stepped into the light, they would be exposed. But if we're going to love like Jesus loves us, then we can't be afraid of the dark. Because we have the light of Christ shining. So we empty ourselves, we walk into somebody's darkness. And here's the catch. We don't wait so much for the invitation to walk in. If Jesus waited for our invitation to walk into our darkness, how many of you, Jesus, would still be waiting outside the door? But you see, Jesus loves us so much that he says, there's no darkness that I will not enter. So if you're here this morning and you are struggling, you are not alone. You might have tried to keep Jesus out, but Jesus is in the middle, shining that light. And I pray that you can see it. For me, for those who, when I've known without a doubt that I've been loved like Christ has loved me, it's people who've walked into my life and said, Leah, I need to talk. We need to talk. For me, for, with certain people, that has been Jesus saying, I love you. Sometimes Jesus sounds like someone who's been with you for a long time saying, we need to talk. Third way, Jesus, if you look at the gospel, he loved us. He loved his disciples besides emptying him by pitching his tent and dwelling in the darkness, is that he had those hard conversations with people. You see, a lot of times what we, we're, we're finding and preaching in Christians' groups is a love that's free, but yet it's so cheap. It's a love that, yeah, I love you. Oh, you're so lovable. But it's cheap and as it doesn't bring transformation. You see Jesus talking to people. One, he sat down and he talked with them. You know, sometimes uh, reaching into somebody's darkness isn't necessarily saying, hey, I'll go to an appointment with you. Or, hey, let's look at this resource. Sometimes it's just saying, hey, let me cook you, su you supper and you come over and talk. Or, hey, join me on this hobby that I love to do. And come do it with me. Come and have some fun. Come and forget about for just a minute. But you also see Jesus sitting down and talk. Think about the woman at well. Yes, he did not judge her. He talked to her enough that she felt love enough to say, yes, you're right. Enough to tell her story. Then, but she, when she left there, she left from shame to praise. She had met Jesus. Literally, spiritually, 
mentally, however she needed, she had met Jesus. But then you also have the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what do I need to do? He says, I've done that. But then Jesus, it says, looks on him with compassion, with love, and tells him the truth. So loving like Jesus means speaking the truth in love and with gentleness. Finally, loving like Jesus, you see in in the Gospels, loving like Jesus means picking up a cross. And guess what? It does mean dying for each other. It, means pick, it says, Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. What is a cross? Well, for us, the cross is the place where sin was laid, where blood was shed, where Christ was sacrificed, gave himself up freely for us, and we're called to do the same. So you and I might not physically die for one another, but we die to ourselves. Means I die to my schedule. I die to my wants. Even might mean I died to my opinion and just be quiet and listen. And that's hard for many of us. Including me sometimes, because you just know I'm right. Some of you have thought that too. Not about me. <laughs> yeah, we could go on and say, loving people like Jesus, he met needs. He fed the hungry, he clothed the naked, he healed. Loving like Jesus brings healing. If we love people like Jesus, it brings healing as well. But you know what? To sum it up, I just spent the entire time briefly going through the gospel saying this is what it looked like to love like Jesus. Paul sums it up in Galatians 6 2. Go back to that slide, please. When he says, carry each other's burdens. Do you want to love like Jesus? Thank you. <laughs> you want to, I do too. But that doesn't look like just saying freely, neely, I love you. Oh, I love you. It means, what does it mean? If we're going to love like Jesus, what are we going to do? We're going to carry each other's burdens. That's what it means. Because to fulfill the law of Christ, the law of Christ is love each other as I have loved you. So that means we better get to burden carrying. But here's the thing about carrying burdens. In order for us to be able to carry each other's burdens, in order to bear each other's burdens, B-E-A-R, Bear each other's burdens. We have to be a. We have to be willing to bear b a r e our burdens to one another. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us a lot of gifts to be the church, to love like Jesus loves. The Holy Spirit has gifted us all in ways to be the church. But anybody got the gift of mind reading? <laughs> I don't. (laughs) And that's not in one of the gifts of the gifts of the Spirit, mind reading. So before you ever say a church is not loving, you have to ask yourself, is this a church that I took the chance to B-A-R-E, bear it all, so to speak? That I took the chance to bear my, put my burdens out there and see if somebody would pick them up and help me carry them. So we don't read minds. And Jesus probably knew what he was doing when he didn't let us read minds. 
Gosh, imagine how long a sermon would be because I'd be so distracted. <laughs> but to, for us to be able to carry you, that you've got, we've got to bear it to one another. Well, what kind of burdens do we carry? You see, you almost, whether or not we know it or not, it's almost like we have a socially acceptable church list of burdens that are socially acceptable to bear for our brothers and sisters to help us carry. Like, for instance, grief over the loss of a loved one seems to be on that list. It seems like most of us feel okay coming to church after we've lost a loved one and saying, you know what, it really is hard. You know what else? It may be on this unspoken, unconscious list of burdens that are reasonable to bear in church. I hope y'all hear the sarcasm in my voice. Would be physical illness. No, it, most of us feel comfortable and say, you know, I've had, had this headache for a week now that won't go away. Would you please lift me up in prayer? But there's other burdens that we're called to carry that for whatever reason we don't feel comfortable enough bearing, B-A-R-E, so yes, struggling with grief. Well, what happens? What happens if I need to be able to come here and say, you know, this morning I didn't with my coffee, I also drunk a fifth of whiskey. Or what if I need to come here and say, you know, this morning before I came to worship. You know, I'm bearing this burden while my kids were watching cartoon. I was in the other room getting dressed watching adult material. You see, the bearing of each other's burdens isn't just the hurts we have. It isn't just when we're sad. It isn't just physical. When Paul says carry each other's burdens, if you go back to verse 1, he's talking about restoring those who have sinned. He's talking about carrying each other's sins and brokenness as well. Actually, I don't think it's too far-fetched to call sin brokenness because the restore, when he says restore the brother or sister, the same word restore is a medical term which means to set a bone that's been broken. So not only are we to bear the hurts and griefs of this life, we are to bear each other's sins. We're, be, we're to bear a place to say, you know what? I struggle with addiction and it's tearing my family apart. I struggle with lying and manipulation and it's tearing my family apart. It's splitting the family too. Because I struggle with it all having to be all about me. I struggle with needing power exerting that power in unhealthy ways over people I love. I need help carrying this burden as God brings healing, as you carry me to the cross and let Christ bring healing. As God restores it. Because isn't that how Jesus loved us? That he brought healing through the cross? Here's the thing, we, have, we carry those burdens to bring healing, to bring transformation, <laughs> to bring new life, that new life found in Christ, even those deep-cutted burdens that really is going to bring a building down. But we carry them not to share home, not to share with the world. That means we don't gossip. We bear, we don't share. Maybe I could buy, not a songwriter, maybe a lingo writer. 
Because some of us in the whole world, some of us, what we have to bear, we need help, a sin we need help bearing, is I gossip. I can't help, I hear something and I need to get on the phone for whatever reason, whether it's attention from friends or whether it's to make myself feel better because someone else is, in my opinion, hurting worse or doing worse than I am. By the way, Scripture says that's a lie, that sin is sin, that's in James. But we are called to be a safe place. That people can be a R E bear and know that there's other people that'll B E A R their burdens. Because that's what it means to love somebody like they love Jesus. You want to be a loving church? What if we're known as the burden bearing church and we work both ways? Burden bearing squared, maybe. You know what's interesting to me is we're a Wesleyan church. And John Wesley, the founder of the Wesleyan movement, he started these small groups. And these small groups, they took off and they spread like wildfire. And let me tell you what, they, these small groups, they met. And they would, they would go up to their members and say, Hey, it's good to see you. And let's get started. Prayer. All right, your turn. What's the, what sins have you committed since we last were together? And everybody here, your heart just stopped. <laughs> Didn't it? Didn't you say, oh, I'm glad she went to that side of the church. I'm glad she leans right. But, but here's the catch. It grew. Do y'all get this? This is what John Wesley was having people meet in small groups to do. They were talking about, they were talking about their burdens. And guess what? I guess it's easier when you know that everybody's going to bring their burdens to share and you're not the only one. But not only were they talking about it, they were bearing each other's burdens. And maybe the reason it grew is because they were experiencing the love of Jesus the Christ. And transformation was happening. Because that, to you and I, is absolutely insane to have a group of four or five people that we walk with, that we answer those questions. But for John Wesley, that was people experiencing the love of Christ. For Galatians... That's how people experience the love of Jesus Christ. That's how we fulfill our call to love people as Christ loved, is to bear burdens. Here's the catch. You notice also in Galatians, I think it's probably verse 3 or 4, uh, die, I don't know, right off the top of my head. Next one. Yes, right here. Each person will have to carry their own load. You see, we're responsible for carrying burdens, just sharing burdens. We're not responsible for their load. What does that mean? You're not responsible for the choices they make. You're not responsible for the attitudes they have. For Paul, in this sec section of Galatians, when he's talking about bearing each other's sins, bearing each other's burdens or sins, so that they can be restored, so that they can be whole. Paul is saying each person has to bear their own load. You're not responsible for their salvation ultimately. That each person will stand before God someday and answer and be judged by God and that is God's thing and he is holy and just. You're not responsible for that. You're not responsible for them taking your advice or making them do what you think they should do. That's on them. That's their load. You're responsible for walking alongside of. And there's some people, as always, I'm always so scared that somebody's here is going to hear me and think 
that I'm that this means that I have to bear the load of an abusive relationship. That's not what I'm saying. Because you can't bear somebody's burden if they're abusing you. So please hear me. Please don't ever hear that coming out of my mouth. You can't bear like Jesus bears if you're being abused. That's not your security. That's definitely not your load. So church, today we're going to get to come to a table. And Jesus, the one who bore all of our burdens, bore all of our sins, the one whose love covered a multitude of sins and says that when we love like him, our love does the same. He invites you to this table just as you are. Pressure and all. If you're about to pop, if you're split in two, what? But if maybe today you come rejoice that you're invited to this table too. This table isn't get yourself right and then come. It's come all you who are hungry and thirsty. All you who are weary. Come and find rest. See, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, the worst possible night of his life. He was thinking about you. Jesus the Christ was thinking about you. If you ever wondered, does Jesus think about me? Absolutely. And guess what? You can't do anything that makes him stop thinking about you. On the worst night, when all his friends would abandon him, he was still caring about them. That night, he took bread, gave thanks to the Father, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for your burdens, for your sin, for your brokenness, for healing, for restoration, for curing. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. After the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to the Father, gave it to his disciples, said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious God, Lord, we give you things that you come and you bear every burden that we have. Lord, that you love us so much that you provide for us. That you enter in and chase after us when we go astray. But God, that you heal us and you say that you came so that we can have life and that life is now in Christ and one day it will be fully realized. So, Lord, as we come to your table, remind us that this isn't three crosses table. This table is yours. And you say, all are welcome. You who struggled this morning, come pull up a seat. You who doubt your worth worthiness, come pull up a seat. You who are rejoicing, Come, pull up a seat. For it's my body and my blood. I gave my life for you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would those who are going to help serve please come forward?
The table is set. The meal is prepared. Christ says, come as you feel led. Come.
closing song this morning, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Sunday school classes. Um, come find me. Come find somebody you started a relationship with here this morning. And say, hey, can can we go somewhere eat, and eat a donut and a cup of coffee and pray together? I'm serious. Don't leave here carrying a burden alone. Because if we're called to love like Christ, let us love you like Christ. So go forth and go forth and love the world like Jesus. Go forth and carry each other's burdens 
and carry them to the one who says, cast all our cares on him. As you take the love of Christ with you, go in peace. Thank you.